The upcoming prequel show is House of the Dragon and not House of the Dire Wolf. Sorry Stark fanboys. I'll be delivering some bad news for you. Don't expect the Starks from the past generations to have much screen time. The writers know how popular this family is, so of course extra easter eggs that were not in the lore books are going to have to be added in. Something fun to look forward to. But the relationship the Starks had with the ruling Targaryen family is very interesting. Both prior to the civil war that we're going to see and after. Like what I've been doing recently, there won't be any spoilers for the show, just some background stuff to get viewers up to speed. Ever since the last Stark King gave up his royal status, after witnessing the Targaryen's dragons and swearing fealty to them, the Starks remained distant from all political drama going on in King's Landing's court. Even when a large part of the realm wanted the Targaryens out after Aegon the Conqueror died, the Starks stayed out of the rebellions popping up. It's kind of a theme in the story that House Stark thrives while staying put in their kingdom, the North and things start to go bad for them when traveling south. After the rebellions were put down and the Targaryens cemented their rule again around 48 years after the original conquest, lots of rebels who are now considered traitors were given the option to lose their head or take the black and join the Brothers of the Night's Watch. A new teenage king, Jaehaerys Targaryen, forgave thousands in order to keep things peaceful in his realm. Some of the new recruits swearing the Night's Watch's vow included four former members of the Kingsguard. Dangerous men to let free. Very bad news for the North. The Night's Watch's decline had been well underway by this point in the timeline. So with all these new mouths to feed and shelter, the commander at the time attempted to restore two crumbling castles along the wall. A former Kingsguard was given to each of the two castles to command over, with some of the other traitors under them. It didn't take long for them to start a mutiny and try to establish themselves as lords of these castles, disregarding their vows. Lord Walton Stark had to get involved to put down this rebellion. The Starks have historically been very close allies to the Night's Watch. Walton arrived at the castles and executed one former Kingsguard, but the other deserter fled beyond the wall. When Walton chased after him to serve justice, he was met by giants who tore him apart. Because of King Jaehaerys' naive decision to send this many known rebels at once to the Night's Watch, it hurt the relationship Targaryens would have with the Starks while Jaehaerys sat on the Iron Throne and his ass would be on that throne for a very long time. 55 years longer than any other Targaryen. It was an awkward time for Jaehaerys when he finally made his visit to Winterfell during one of his continent-wide tours atop his dragon. Lord Walton's younger brother, Alaric, succeeded him as the new Lord Stark. He didn't welcome the Targaryens warmly. The first thing he did was take the king to his brother's tomb. Alaric told Jaehaerys, Walton lies down here in darkness in no small part thanks to you. Stars and swords, the leavings of your seven gods, what are they to us? And yet you sent them to the wall in their hundreds and thousands. So many that the Night's Watch was hard pressed to feed them. And when the worst of them rose up, the Oathbreakers you had sent us, it cost my brother's life to put them down. Jaehaerys replied, a grievous price, but that was never our intent. You have my regrets, my lord, and my gratitude. Alaric ended the conversation with, I would sooner have my brother. When most lords see hosting the king and queen as a great honor and a chance to go closer to the Targaryens in hopes of climbing the political ladder, Alaric was ice cold towards them. They would arrive with a large host that needed to be fed and he did not want to see his people's food go wasted on them, telling the queen winter is coming while still being in the middle of summer. A very stark thing to say. Jaehaerys' sister wife, good queen Alicene, had an easier time getting along with Alaric the more she spent time with him. After her visit to the Wall and the Night's Watch, she talked Alaric into giving the Wall more land so they could hunt south of the Wall. That would mean taking Northerners' land away, something Alaric's bannermen wouldn't appreciate. The Starks weren't happy, but couldn't turn down the Queen's request, especially if it had to do with helping the Night's Watch out. Alicene wasn't completely able to patch things up between the houses. Towards the end of the old King Jaehaerys' reign, the line of succession grew complicated, with the old man outliving some of his sons. A great council was held so that all the realm's lord could vote on which Targaryen to succeed Jaehaerys. It would be between a great-grandson named Laenor Valerion, who technically had the better claim since he descended from Jaehaerys' elder son, and then there was a grandson named Viserys, descendant of a younger. It was the norm to pass on any female if there are male heirs available. That's why Jaehaerys' granddaughter and eldest potential heir was passed on early on. But what happens if this older female heir has a son? Do you still skip the line entirely? That was left for all the lords to decide, because Jaehaerys wanted a peaceful transition of power. 
you would think the female lion's son would be overlooked just like she was. But Princess Rhaenys had a lot of noble support behind her son. The Valerians, thanks to her powerful husband, the legendary Loras Corlys Valerion. And she had the Baratheons backing her claim because of her mother being a Baratheon. By this point in the story, Alaric had long since been dead. A descendant with unknown ties to him, probably a grandson or something, would be the Lord Stark taking part in this great council. Even with all the Valerion's bribes, few wanted to see a female line have the priority over a male. So when a 20 to 1 landslide, Viserys was chosen over Laenor Valerion. But the Starks joined in with Corlys and the Baratheons to support Laenor, to try and see the first ever Valerion sit on the Iron Throne as opposed to a Targaryen. Yes, his mother was a Targaryen, but he did have his father's surname. It would be a notable change for the realm. This vote showed the animosity the Starks felt towards the Targaryens, specifically Jaehaerys, was still alive and strong years after the Night's Watch situation, where they lost a lord and a lot of land. Adding insult to injury, the land Queen Alysanne was so adamant to gift in the Night's Watch was left unkept because it was too much to be manned. This only annoyed the Northerners more. Even with nothing to gain from seeing a Valyrian sit on the Iron Throne, this also showed Northerners being open to seeing the female line taken into consideration. Very progressive for this world setting. We probably won't be seeing Alaric or even Ellard in House of the Dragon. I recon Stark. The Lord Stark named that we hear in the trailer when King Viserys orders all the lords to swear to protect his daughter Princess Rhaenyra's right of succession is Rickon Stark. The only thing he's really known for is raising a cool character. This should be the only scene in the entire series with Lord Rickon, because the books don't even outright state which Lord Stark was empowered during this event in King's Landing. His son, Cregan, who wasn't born by this point, is where all the gold moments should come from. The writers will have a little bit of creative liberty to work with this character, since aside from being a known badass, there's still a lot they can do to flesh him out. Ned's older brother, Brandon Stark, who was executed by the Mad King long before the events of Game of Thrones, is a good comparison. The character I consider to be the greatest knight in the story, Aemon the Dragon Knight Targaryen, said that Cregan Stark was the best swordsman he ever faced. And Aemon was constantly in high intensity battles. He was a member of the Kingsguard in a turbulent time. The Starks had a little bit of drama going on at Winterfell after King Viserys named his daughter heir instead of his male relatives. Cregan succeeded his father when he was 13. So until he was of age to rule, typically 16, his uncle would run things from the north for him as a regent. But this uncle was a little slow in letting go of his power. If House of the Dragon really wants to take things outside the Civil War in focus, we could get an episode or two in Winterfell, delving into younger Cregan's character, who only gets to play a very minor role. Aside from this little bit of drama, Lord Cregan will also have to decide who to support in the Civil War 20 years later. The North could have easily stayed out of the war, like how they usually handled things, being so removed from King's Landing, but this situation was a little different. The Targaryens were at the peak of their power, to find their call to action could have repercussions. So negotiating terms would be smarter. Cregan wasn't all brawn, he had some brains too. Long winters usually meant starvation and famine in the north, so some older men who volunteered could be given up to this cause that had nothing to do with the north. Two birds with one stone. Easy. It's a customary thing for the older generation to leave their home so there's more food for the young. Some fans like to point out this time in the story as evidence for a dragon living under Winterfell, warming up the Stark's castle. A character does mention that a dragon rider who negotiated with Cregan had his dragon lay eggs in the castle's crypt. So let's see how the prequel will handle this fan theory. There will have to be an episode or two dedicated to Winterfell, probably the second season, with this dragon rider and an older Cregan. If the writers really want to milk the Stark fan service, you can even spend half the season here. There's Cregan's supposed bastard half-sister Sarah Snow that's pretty much a blank slate for the writers who has some rumors surrounding her time at Winterfell during the Stark negotiations. Keep in mind, the Northerners didn't even care to see King Viserys sit on the Iron Throne. Imagine how much they care to see which one of his children sit on the Iron Throne after him. Cregan and the old men called Winter Wolves that were deployed south will have their small moments, nothing too hype. Game of Thrones was mostly the Stark show, and now the prequel will be the Targaryen show.